Welcome to the Terrence and Mark Experience with your host from Los Angeles, California, Mark Taylor, and from Wareham, Massachusetts, U.S. of A., the rock sponge himself, Terrence Reardon. Now kick on back, relax, open some beverages, and listen to two intense rock music fans from opposite sides of the U.S. coasts talk about whatever album comes to mind, movie, whatever. So without further ado, here are your hosts of the Terrence and Mark Experience, Terrence and Mark. Hey, this is Terrence Reardon, the Terrence on the Terrence and Mark Show, and welcome to the first episode of the Terrence and Mark Experience. This is Terrence Reardon, and alongside him is Mark Taylor. Today, we're talking about the debut album from San Francisco's greatest hard rock metal export, Metallica, and their debut album, Kill Em All. Before I talk about the Kill Em All album and Mark's introduction to it, I will talk about the history of this album before I hand it over to Mark. Metallica formed in 1981 in San Francisco, California, with singer-guitarist James Hetfield, who was also the main songwriter of the band, as well as Danish-born drummer Lars Ulrich, who migrated to California and befriended James and formed the band. And they had a few guitarists before Dave Mustaine became their first main guitarist, and Ron McGovney was their first bass player, but Ron quit the band because of Dave Mustaine's maniacal behavior once he got a little too drunk and nasty drunk. <laughs> so, Megadeth, um, I mean Metallica, sorry, I got the two confused. Metallica then recruited former trauma bass player Cliff Burton after Hetfield and Ulrich spot him at a club with the band Trauma playing this unearthly sounding bass guitar. You know, like, oh my god, we gotta get that guy in our band. And they invited Cliff Burton to replace McGovney and the, that lineup was the lineup, I believe, that recorded the EP called No Life Till Leather, the demo tape that became an independent sensation in the taping trade community. This is in the days before Napster and illegal downloading. In those days, they traded cassette tapes and things. It was a big hit in the underground community in the, in the metal world. And, um, and apparently one of the copies landed in the hands of one John Zazula, a guy who formed an independent record label called Megaforce, and he signed Metallica after being blown away by that No Life to Leather demo tape. So the band, on a shoestring budget, drove all the way from California, where they wound up basing in San Francisco after Los Angeles rejected them, to New York to record this debut album. And the first thing they did when they got to New York was fire Dave Mustaine. And, um, you know, he was asleep on the bus or in the back of the U-Haul. They woke him up one day and said, hey, um, Dave, you're out of the band. And then Mustaine's response was, what? No warning? No second chance? But um, in the end, it turned out to be a big favor in both bands. And um, they quickly had to find a replacement, so they heard of Exodus guitarist Kirk Hammett, who would become an essential part of the band in later years. His lead guitar style was the perfect replacement for Dave Mustaine, and then on a shoestring budget, Metallica recorded its debut album, Kill Em All, in May 1983 in New York with producer Paul something or other, and I don't have the CD on me right now, but you all, if you have the CD, you know what I'm talking about. And um, when the album was done, the original title for this album was going to be called Metal Up Your Ass. <laughs> but the trouble was the Zazulas, John and the Mrs. Marsha, who were the executive producers of this album, balked at that title. They hated the title, they even hated the album's original cover, which was the, the, the hand of the knife coming out of the toilet. <laughs> they absolutely said, no fucking way, Jose. 
You are not putting this on the album cover. Forget it. You're not naming the album metal up your ass either. So then the guys in the band said, all right, fine. We'll come up with another title. So they came up with Kill Em All on the front cover with a hand, a sledgehammer, and blood. <laughs> how metal is that? And before I talk about how I got introduced to this album, I'll let my new co-host, Mark, give you the inside scoop on how he got introduced to this fine album. Well, the first time I got into Metallica, I got into it late. Uh, my friend Scott had the CD and uh, had a car with like big old 12-inch woofers and big old amplifier. And he wanted to blast it in my car, and I said, go ahead. And he says, well, you got to hear this band box. And I go, okay. So I heard it, and I go, oh, my God, the first beginning of Hit the Lights. So I was like, wow, I'm sold. And then he just played the whole album, and he had the version with Emma Evil and a Blitzkrieg on it, which he, which is not out anymore. You could get that, those songs on uh, Garage Days, Garage Incorporated now. And it was a really cool album. I never got into them, so then I just started going backwards and forwards on their catalog. Well, not backwards, because that was their first album. Forwards and listened to the rest of the catalog, and I was sold in one of my favorite bands to this day. And um, I got into Kill 'Em All. It was actually the third Metallica album I ever heard in May of 1989. I had been a fan for two years, starting with Master of Puppets, obviously. Then And Justice for All was second. Then I heard... I stole Kill Em All from my sister's ex-boyfriend, that same copy he had with Am I Evil and Butts Creek. And Butts Creek ended side one of the cassette, and Am I Evil ended side two of the cassette. And uh, Ride the Lightning followed, and I just became a fan of them. Some albums I like more than others, and some albums I love, some albums I hate. But I keep going back to Metallica, and they're one of the few bands I have yet to see live in concert. And it will happen sooner or later. And, um, you know, the, the, the songs we will talk about, all the songs, including Am I Evil and Blitz Creek in this review, so we'll use the Electra version of uh, Kill Em All as released that was available from 88 to 95. So without further ado, we'll begin the review right this moment. We begin with Hit the Lights, and this song is just so incredible with the way it begins with that machine gun bit. Guys going all guns blazing on the sign at the beginning, and it kicks in with the heavy, you know, the heavy riff. No life to leather. We're gonna kick some ass tonight. And James Hetfield just screaming his friggin' balls off on this track. It's just so awesome. I mean, anyone who doesn't like hit the lights, you need to have your ears clean. This sign is just so excellent and kick ass. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, this song is the the first song that got me into it when I heard I love drums. Uh, drums is my favorite instrument, even though I can't play with my mom when it came to drum set. But I really love the freaking the intro to the, hit the lights, and I was like, whoa, who is this band? I go, man, why haven't I listened to this band before? <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I am a drummer, by the way. I've been playing drums since I was uh, tw 11, 12 years old, and uh, Lars Ulrich is a great drummer. A lot of people who say he sucks, you need to be bitch slapped. Yeah, he's really good. I, I have no problems with him except for St. Anger. <laughs> yeah. That, those drums sounded like baseball bats. It sounded they, like he's hitting tin cans. <laughs> tin cans with a baseball bat. Yeah. Anyway, back to right, Kill Em All We Go, and we come to the second track in the album, The Four Horsemen, which originated as a song called Mechanics, but James Hetfield wound up rewriting the lyrics after... Uh, Dave Mustaine was ousted and replaced by Kirk Hammett, who joined just in time for the album to be recorded. And the lyrics with um, the Four Horsemen lyrics and a few modifications. The Metallica version has Megadeth's beat by a slight margin, because the Four Horsemen to me is just epic. Am I right or wrong, Mark? Yeah, it's really epic. I, I especially like it when it slows down in the middle, the part that Hatfield added to it. I really, I like it when a song like slows down and speeds back up, goes back down, up and down. It just gets you, it just wakes you up. <laughs> and you can see that again. And uh, anything else to add? It's been played on many tours, hasn't it? Yeah, I've, I've seen them uh, twice on the Black Tour and uh, once with the Guns N' Roses Tour. Oh my and god. Then, and then that was terrible. I walked out on Guns N' Roses. Oh my and god. Then, <laughs> and then I, uh, because, yeah, they had the female horn section and the female backing vocals, Guns N' Roses. Oh, well, Axel was being a jerk that night, and he was just 
freaking, I think Living Color said something about it the next day, how Axel needs some balls up or something to stay on stage. Um, Living Color was on that tour also. And I saw them uh, uh, Death Magnetic tour, which was awesome at the, uh, in Anaheim. Wow. Really good. Missed that tour because I was living in South Carolina where they weren't friggin' they don't have many hard rock metal shows go to that redneck hellhole. Yeah. I really enjoy I, I enjoy this whole album and this song is when I, I can't really pick a favorite off this album, but I think uh, Hit the Lights is my favorite and this one's second. Yeah, you can see that again. I agree with you. Actually, Four Horsemen is probably tied for my favorite song on the album along with another one. And then I'll tell you what it is when we get to it. Next is another killer track called Motor Breath. I think they nicked the name to pay homage to their favorite, one of their biggest influences, Motorhead. And the song, just like the two preceding tracks, another thrash classic, which doesn't sound out of date, still sounds fresh today. And just an awesome, awesome, awesome song. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, Motor Breath really kicks ass. I, I love it. I just love this whole album. I don't know how much I can say I love this album so much, but um, it's really killer song. I, I think there's a lot of progressive elements to this album with them slowing down their time signatures or whatever they do on this album. It's more it's more than thrash to me. Excellent. Now we come to one of the earlier Metallica staples, Jump in the Fire, which was on that uh, No Life to Other demo, I believe, with a few other tracks, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Jump in the Fire, excellent song. It was actually the first song from the album I heard when I stole the tape. The song was queued <laughs> up to Jump in the Fire. The tape was queued up to Jump in the Fire. This was the first thing I heard from it, and I was just blown away by it. I love the song. The only complaint I had about it was Michael Savage did burn the intro out on his uh, show, or he used to burn it out on his intro, since I don't listen to terrestrial radio anymore, I can actually go back and play the song now in its entirety, not just the intro, because, you know, the song is awesome. To play just 30 seconds of it every day, it just does get, get annoying, but, you know, you need to hear the full friggin' song, which, thankfully, I can listen to the full friggin' song again, thanks to me not listening to the radio. Jump in the Fire, another song that had Dave Mustaine helping in the co-write because it was written before he was ousted. Another kick-ass tune, Jump in the Fire Rules. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I was reading about Jump in the Fire. It's a song originally about a teenage sexual frustration <laughs> and retitled. Uh, something about... I was laughing about that when I read that. Oh, my God. And, uh, yeah, Mustaine, he's really... You could hear a lot of Megadeth on, on the four songs on this. Uh, seems like uh, Kirk Hammett was kind of going doing the Stains type type solos on this. He really came more into his own after he went to Joe Satriani for the second album. That's in my opinion. That's that's an excellent thing. And Jump in the Fire is one of the songs that's withstood the test of time for Metallica. And it doesn't sound like a 32 year old recording, as neither as far as either of us are concerned. Next is an instrumental called Anesthesia. Pulling Teeth, which is basically Cliff Burton doing this monstrous bass guitar solo, and I think it was the first take, because it was take one, but I think it just turns out to be the take that was used was the first take, and him just going completely haywire when I first heard this. I was like, is that a distorted you know, bass guitar with some electric guitars being thrown in, or is it all bass? And it turns out it was all bass, with uh, you know Cliff Burton using the wah-wah distortion going through like a Marshall amp. And then there's no other instruments apart from some drums that come in to, you know, after the wow. Just an excellent, excellent. Cliff Burton, may he rest in peace. This instrumental is just so beautiful. And uh, I don't know what else to say about anesthesia, pulling teeth, but awesome instrumental, great bass solo. And Cliff Burton, we wish you were still around. May your soul rest in peace. Mark, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, if Cliff, Cliff Burton was still around, there would be bass on Injustice for All, I tell you that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a really great song. Yeah, I was listening to it, like you said. There's a lot of distortion on it. It kind of reminds me of, like, Chris Squire of Yes, when he does, like, a bass solo. A lot of distortion. He could play, play it like a guitar. It's just amazing the way it comes out, and especially when Lars comes in at the end with yes. the drums and it just starts kicking it. <laughs> It's just incredible, and then it ends with the bass going completely haywire after the drums end, and there's like bass effects for like uh, 30 seconds, 
because that little effect leads into the song that closed side one of the original Megaforce version of this album, Whiplash. And this song is just a friggin' amazing. The, f the lyrics are a little hard to decipher unless you have the lyric sheet, which thankfully I did on the cassette. You know, and it was one of, you know, it had a few more obscenities compared to a few of the earlier tracks. I mean, the only obscenity you heard on the first track was ass, and on this one you hear the F bomb like a couple of times. Drive you in mad! And then another F bomb somewhere in the song. <laughs> and you hear the band utter the name, We're Metallica, in the song. And then the chorus always hits me Adrenaline starts a flow. Do, 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 do. You're thrashing all around. Blah, 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 blah. Acting like a maniac. Whiplash. Whiplash. <laughs> Just an awesome, 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 awesome song. Metallica still play it live every now and again. And a song that. Like I said, this whole album is still great, and the song is still excellent, and I wonder what Mark has to say about Whiplash. This is a really great song, and I've seen them every time live. They played this song. Sometimes when Jason Newstead was there, he would sing it, and they would switch instruments, and James would go to the drums, and Lars would go on guitar. It was, it was pretty funny, but it, it was really great to watch live, and everybody's like breaking their necks headbanging in the audience to it it's just like when once that first quarter comes in everybody's going <laughs> they're already ready for it oh man you know like i said folks metallica is one band i've yet to see live but when they do tour you bet your ass i'll go see them when they come to new england once again and then you flip the record to side two and we begin with another classic out of phantom lord which is another great track um, just an awesome song. I mean, I'll, I won't have much more to say, says the man who does these 20-minute interludes about the song structures and how it was written and things. You know, I just, you know, I do did my research on Kill em All and things, but, you know, Phantom Lord, excellent track. In fact, they did a re-recorded version with Crowd Noises, I believe, as one of the B-sides of the Jump in the Fire EP when that was released in um, 83 on Music for Nations, which I had that EP on cassette a long time ago. And I actually preferred that version to the version on Kill em All, but still an awesome song nevertheless. What's your take? Yeah, I really I really like this song. There's, there's not one filler track on this album. Like, uh, I hear people talk about, oh, all killer, no filler. This is what it is. It's all killer, no filler. This album does not d disappoint at all. Absolutely. Anything else to add to Phantom Lord? Are you all set? Uh, no, I'm all set on that one. All right, Mark, before we get to the next track, we're going to play the B-side version of Phantom Lord, which appeared originally on the Jump in the Fire EP, Jump in the Fire single EP, whatever you want to call it. This is a altered version, which appeared on that uh, Jump in the Fire EP. I will be right back. Hope you enjoy it.
All right. Now we go to No Remorse. Again, short, punchy to the point. Awesome song, excellent, the way it goes, the structure. Just a brilliant, brilliant song. I don't have much more to say on No Remorse. That's a song you just put on uh, 60 in your car and jam it and just start singing it. No remorse, no regret, we don't care. What the <laughs> you're just saying that people look at you like a loon while you're driving. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. And those who got into Metallica with the Black Album and heard this album, many people who got into them with the Black Album hate this album. You people are poser fans. You're not even real Metallica fans, which we consider ourselves to be. Anyways, we digress. Next is the album's now most famous song here on the radio, but at the time of its release, you didn't because radio wouldn't touch this stuff with a 39.5-foot pole, Seek and Destroy. Such a... Uh, excellent song a song that metallica still plays live they've played live since its release run away hiding you will be dying a thousand deaths do 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 search and seek and destroy what an awesome awesome song structure wise and this too was on the jump in the fire ep as our studio re-recording with the crowd noises added because they weren't playing big venues by at that stage yet but Seek and Destroy, awesome song, although radio plays it now, when it was released, they didn't really care, but it's held up on like many things that came out in 1983. Michael Jackson Thriller, I'm Looking at You, Can't Slow Down by Lionel Richie, I'm Staring at You as well with Angry Eyes. Kill em All, doesn't sound like that dated Thriller drink. What do you think? Yeah, it's true, uh, it doesn't sound like uh, Lionel Richie at all. <laughs> Lionel Richie's really dated. Uh, Seek and Destroy, it's a really cool, con really great concert song. The audience gets really involved in this. They put the mic out, and the fans are basically singing it now. It's uh, really good. You hear that? You hear the riff, first riff coming in. People are already headbanging with their hands up, horns out, just jamming to them, and Metallica lets the fans sing it basically in concert. Whoops, you all right there? Yeah, I just fell in my chair. That's all right. <laughs> We'll leave that in for comedic value. <laughs> now, before we talk about the final song on Kill 'Em All, we're going to play the EP, Jump in the Fire EP version of Seek and Destroy, which is basically a studio recording with live audience loop added to it. But I think an excellent version anyway. It's not available now. It's This version is long out of print. So listen, I hope you enjoy it, and we'll be right back to review Metal Militia after you hear this altered version of Seek and Destroy.
And the original Kill 'Em All album ends with Metal Militia, which, of course, is another excellent, excellent heavy throttled rocker track. And this, of course, you know, the Metallica fans, I think, were the Metal Militia, or Metal fans in general, the song is about. And this song is awesome the way it flows. And I even love the ending with the marching sounds going off into the distance, just uh, going at full throttle into the into the end it went, and think, and that's how the original vinyl version of Metal uh, Kill 'Em All ended. What do you think of Metal Militia, um, Mark? It's a very kick-ass song. It's a great ending ending for the album. Like hit the lights. It's a great beginner. It's just like just completes the album except for the first two the bonus tracks that come on on the electro version. But <clears throat> this for, from the original version is really a good killer for ending the album. Right, and now we. And of course, when Kill 'Em All was released on uh, Megaforce, it really didn't set the world on fire initially. But once Metallica got their deal with Elektra Records in 1984 here in America, and Vertigo Phonogram at the time, it's now Universal Music in for the rest of the world, outside the U.S. and Canada, then Ride the Lightning got re-released. Master of Puppets, of course, was released as the first album for the label, and then. Before Injustice for All came out, Elektra Records re-released Kill 'Em All in sometime in '88 with two bonus tracks. First, I'll, I'll talk about Am- Blitzkrieg first, and it's a cover of a song by a, a, a little-known metal band called Blitzkrieg. It was their theme song, if it were. And I haven't heard the original Blitzkrieg, but I've heard the one Metallica did, and it's just an awesome awesome cover they did they have not ever done a bad cover you know even uh they made the merciful fate cover on garage ink sound listenable because king diamond's voice got on my nerves james hetfield thankfully doesn't what's creek awesome the way it ends is fucking hilarious with one of the guys in the band belching and laughing and then <laughs> lars ulrich here going i fucked up in one place and they left those imperfections in there showing the metallica had a great sense of humor what do you think of uh, Blitzkrieg, my man? Yeah, but I never really heard the original version, but I found out it was a cover. I go, man, I thought it was their song because they, they owned it. They took care, took that song and just shoved it down your throat. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. And next, and we end the Electra Records version of this album with the first Electra Records press of it from 88 with another track recorded during the... Cr- Ride the Lightning, post Ride the Lightning sessions. Am I Evil, originally done by Diamond Head. I later heard the Diamond Head version, and it's just, their version was, I think Metallica took the song, bettered it, put it on steroids, and made it better and more, more ballsy and things. Especially, you know, the way it begins. Metallica's version was just more thunderous, heavy, bludgeoning. More kick ass. Diamond Head's version, I've not ever heard. I've heard bits of it, but. Metallica owns this song. What do you think? Yeah, Metallica totally owns it. I've never heard the original. I don't think I want to because this song is just so incredible to listen to on its own. And I, when I you have the CD with the, the bonus tracks, I just put this song on repeat and drive around with the windows open and make everybody hear it. <laughs> yeah, Am I Evil? A lot of people hate this song. If, you're, if listeners are fans of... Uh, Backstreet Boys or any of those people, you probably hate Metallica, but oh well. Uh, we think Backstreet. this. Huh? Backstreet Boys isn't even music. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you put the letter S before hit, and you have my exact opinion of it. Sure is. Backstreet Boys, New Kids on the Block, One Direction. No, uh, di- I'm getting a headache. No direction. <laughs> no direction. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've heard uh, some people committed suicide because that one girl. That one guy left singing or something. <laughs> As is, I go, wow. It's just a singer in a band. Calm down, people. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not like, uh, I mean, it's not like when Rick Wright passed away, the whole, no, you didn't hear a peep about that. Yeah. Uh, did they even give him a thing on the Grammys? Uh, nope. Yeah. A memoriam? Nope. They didn't do it with Janie Lane or anybody Sit like Barry. that either. Said nobody. The Grammys is just shameful. They don't need, they have no clue. Yeah, and funny, we talk about Metallica. Their first Grammy nomination was for And Justice for All, 
but the Grammy people were so cool as they gave it to a progressive rock band, Jethro Tull. And my farmer's on the freeway, I think, or the album. Uh, Crest of the Nave. <laughs> huh? Crest of the Nave, the album itself. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I like the song on there though. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great, that's a great album. Yeah. But um, it wasn't metal. I mean, the no, it wasn't weren't. metal. But um, you know, and, and uh, they, gave it to, they gave it this year to a cover of a metal song. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah, Tenacious D. Yeah, um, Tenacious D. Hey, I love Tenacious D. They're funny and all, but come on, man. At least yeah, exactly. Dio got some credit this time. Yeah. He's never got a Grammy. That yeah. guy's so robbed. Yeah, no shit. I mean, Metallica's won quite a few of them. And in fact, when Metallica did win for Enter Sandman, they did manage to thank uh, Jethro Tull for not uh, putting out an album at that time. <laughs> I remember Guns N' Roses was all up in uh, arms that uh, Metallica didn't win that year, too. <laughs> yeah. They were nominated. Yeah, That's Guns and funny. Roses. Guns and Roses weren't even nominated for uh, Appetite for Destruction, funnily enough. Yeah, well, I don't think they had the metal award, did they? Back then, they just put that in and took it out. Yeah, Hard Rock Metal in 1989. Yeah. Kurt Loder, when he was reading the nominees, goes ACDC, Iggy Pop, um, Metallica, Jane's Addiction, and Guns and Jethro Tull. No Guns and Roses, just Jethro Tull. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember so cool. when the MTV Music Awards was dominated by freaking metal and rock, mm -hmm. Van Halen, Metallica, Poison, whatever was on there. Even Rush. Now it's just now, yeah. And now it's just like uh, what what uh, Pretty Boy we could get on there, or what uh, Madonna. Let's bring old Madonna up there and kiss somebody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like you know, like your Aguilera's, your Spears's, and all of them. They're basically supermodels who can't sing. Yeah. True. Britney Spears lip sings in concert. It's a proven fact. <laughs> yeah. Where's Phil Collins when you need him? At least, you know, he would fuck up a lyric every time live. Yeah, I wish I... I never got to see Phil live or Genesis. I was so disappointed when they went on that reunion tour and I didn't have money. I, I got to see him. I flew back to Boston just to see it. Yeah, you're freaking lucky. I love to see... I hope he gets gets better he he's itching to play music you hear him say oh, yep. i'm retired no i'm not <laughs> he, he's going back and forth you know he's gonna come back <clears throat> and i did and i did get to uh see david gilmore and pink floyd in 94 too i saw them too at the uh rose bowl yep division bell tour here yeah yeah that, that was a concert i i was pissed at my friend because he uh uh he brought some bad weed sorry about that but <laughs> i smoked back then <laughs> i didn't i'm allergic to it yeah, well, my brother, I was... my brother JJ, my friend Dennis, myself, and my brother JJ's friend Steve, we were the only four at Gillette C at Foxborough Stadium in May of '94, not high on any drugs. We didn't even smoke or drink anything because neither of us. De my friend Dennis and I are, have, are lifelong non-smokers, non-drinkers, non-drug users. In fact, him and I, he, him and I get violent headaches when we breathe in marijuana. It's just for him, it's just like ugh. And my brother JJ, who was a former jock, he's just like, give him his beer, he'd be extremely happy. But, you know, I was just so ensconced by seeing them live. In fact, I skipped my senior prom for Pink Floyd, in retrospect, the best decision I ever made in my life. Dang, yeah, I, lo I love the show. I just slapped my friend in, in the middle of it, go, dude, this weed sucks. I wanted to get high at a Pink Floyd concert. You ruined it. They're never coming back again. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And I've seen Rush five times live. I've seen them seven. Wow, really yeah, beat. great concert. I can't see them this time. I'm so pissed. The tickets are so high. Because yeah. it's a farewell tour. Yeah. They're not calling it that, but it is. We know it's the farewell tour. Yeah. Just you like know, the Division it, Bell tour was not intended to be Pink Floyd's final tour, but David Gilmore's personal life took so many twists and turns that it turned out that way. Yeah, Neil Peart has a lot of uh, tendonitis in his arms and arthritis and it, he can't he says he can't do it anymore and he wants to spend time with his new daughter hang on just one sec okay. don't mm. worry some of this bits some of these bits will be edited out um folks we 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 very off topic a little bit but that's all right because we're talking about music here and we reviewed metallica's kill em all in this episode and um let's see now we should do a little list of Least favorite Metallica albums to, you know, do you have like your top five Metallica favorite albums, songs, whatever? Yeah, uh, first, I think first is Master of Puppets, and then second would be Kill 'Em All, third, uh, 
uh, ride the lightning, then four, uh, I'm trying to, uh, my mind is blank right now. Uh, justice? Yeah, Justice for All. And I actually do like the Black album. I have no problem with it. I put it to fifth, but my, my worst metallic album has to be Saint Anger. The lyrics are great. It's just the production and the sound just drives me bad. <clears throat> well, I, my top five Metallica albums are as followed. Number five would be probably Death Magnetic. Number four would be Controversial, Master of Puppets. Number three, And Justice for All. Mm. Number two, Kill Em All. Number one, Ride the Lightning. They're all good choices. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I love Death Magnetic. Some people say it was just a cop out, just to appease the fans, just to uh, go back to thrash. I, I think it was well made, and the only thing I don't like about it is the the production and how they uh, they just turn up all the sounds, and you don't get no separation of the of the instruments anymore. It's yeah. just the loudness wars. It just drives me batty. It's Rick Rubin is a really bad at that now. He does it with every album he produces now. Yeah, it's unfortunate because uh, Ted Jensen tried to master it as precisely as he could, you know, audiophile master. But unfortunately, it was so much bleeding from uh, Rick Rubin's production, whoever did the engineering, that was pretty hard for him to master it properly with, um, you know, to have it like almost audiophile. Because normally Ted Jensen does an excellent job with things that he masters, like um, the Eagles remasters from 99 he did. Excellent job. Much of the Styx albums from Cornerstone forward, he did the mastering for, and he's basically Dennis DeYoung's mastering engineer, resident mastering engineer. And um, and for Rick Rubin, the production on Death Magnetic was bad, but I can overlook it because the songs were great. And plus, I called it the return of Kirk Hammett because on Saint Anger, there was no guitar souls, and I thought I was listening to a bad freaking Stained or Lincoln Park album. Yeah, I was. That's the first thing I noticed. The first thing I noticed was the tin can drums, and then I go, uh, "There's no solo. Next song, no solo. Next." I go, "This sucks." <laughs> I go, "One of the best musicians in the band, and they're not even spotlighting him. He's just playing grunge freaking melodies there." And detuned guitars. Yeah. And on the title track, you hear a little bit of the uh, at the time popular Lincoln Park rap rock sort of thin, Lynn Biscuit sort of. Uh, Thresh it out, thresh it out. I'm like, sheesh, when did they jump on the rap bandwagon? <laughs> Limp Biscuit gives me a headache. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Limp Jizzit, I call them. And, um, you know, and then the Black Album, you know, although I love it, kind of burned out upon it because radio plays it. My favorite song was actually one that radio never played, Don't Tread On Me. Yeah, that's one of my top songs on that album, too. Don't Tread On Me. Yeah, so be it, friend or foe. What an awesome, awesome song. I mean, sheesh. There's more to that album than just most of side one. You know, A yeah. Wolf and Man was another favorite of mine. Shape Shift. Yeah, I, I, just, I just love the hard-hitting drums on that. <laughs> it's just like, that album, yeah. people call it wuss, wuss Metallic. I don't understand. That album's pretty hard. It is It is pretty Freaking hard. Kill, killer ass solos. Freaking Jason Newstead learned how to play bass on yeah. that album. In fact, yeah, Bob Little, uh, not Bob, uh, Bob Rock. I get the two Bobs mixed. Bob Rock actually did a damn good job with uh, the production and engineering on that album. Yeah, I have a few people hate Bob Rock. I love Bob, Bob Rock. His production with the Cult uh, albums he's done. I've never had one one bad album except for Saint Anger. <laughs> yeah, and he also was responsible for uh, Motley Crue's Doctor Feelgood. Yeah, I love that album too. And he also did the 1994 uh, Motley Crue album that I think is superior to all the <laughs> Motley Crue albums with Vince Neil. It's one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, I mean, my cutoff with the original Crue was Shout at the Devil. Yeah, and then, uh, I like Doctor Feelgood, but when the first 94, it took me a few years to get into the 94 one. But at first, I was pissed because Vince was gone, and then I I didn't listen to it. I was one of the people who didn't buy it. And then years later, I go, "What the hell was I thinking? This album freaking kicks ass." <laughs> Yeah, no shit. Yeah. I mean, Load and Reload had its moments, but it should have been just one album. Yeah, just like Use Your Illusion with Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah, because I was listening to... There's a few songs on Load I actually loved. I do love Ain't My Bitch. You know, it's rare to see Kirk Hammett play some slide guitar. Um, Until It Sleeps was a great song. 
Bleeding Me, I think, which was the song that closed the first half of the album, that one. Boom, do, 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 do. That's another one that stood out for me. Even then, I liked the country-ish song, Mama Said, which acoustic guitar-wise reminded me of um, Mother from Pink Floyd. That's probably one of the reasons why I love that song, is acoustic guitar-wise, it just cried out Mother, but the only thing missing was a Gilmore-like guitar solo that would have made that song even more epic. Standing on top of the wall? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like a, yeah, that's just I mean, and then on reload you had things like Fuel, which is a great sign, Memory Remains. Unforgiven too, I can you know, it's just basically I only heard that album once. I had it briefly and I turned it in for something, I forgot probably a Led Zeppelin thing. But um I should give Load and Reload another go. They're actually pretty cheap now to buy on I mean, and then on Reload you had things like Fuel, which is a great sign. Memory Remains. Unforgiven too. I can, you know, it's just basically I only heard that album once. I had it briefly and I turned it in for something. I forgot. Probably a Led Zeppelin thing. But um, I should give Load and Reload another go. They're actually pretty cheap now to buy on CD. So I will rebuy those two albums because Load's now like five bucks on CD and Reload I think is like six or seven. So what the hell? I'll take the punch. Uh, I- I enjoyed 90% of those, both of those albums. There was a couple songs that I didn't really care for on both albums, but I think they're they're really good because I like it when a band changes. I don't like it when they want to just sit on their hands and that's and just say, let's do what makes us money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people call Metallica sellouts and things for cha- trying new different things. I mean, if they, you know, no disrespect to ACDC because I love ACDC, but they've done the same album quite a few times. They're the only band that could get away with that, though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on the last album that Brian Johnson wrote lyrics for was um, Blow Up Your Video. And one of the worst songs that people hate is one of my all-time favorites called Rough Stuff. Yeah. But look on every uh, ACDC album, there's a song with rock in it. <laughs> yeah. Like the, like the new album, Rock or Bust. Yeah. <laughs> rock, rock, yeah. Uh, rock and Roll Train. <laughs> yeah. Although they don't say it, you know, everything yeah. is rock and roll, those guys. But just they, rock, just pure, unadulterated rock and roll for them, just yep. raw. And Metallica, you know, they've experimented and they actually got away with uh, doing some of their experimentations. Megadeth, I had to be in a certain mood to play. The S&M album was uh, pretty decent with the, you know, marrying metal and orchestra. At least they succeeded, unlike Kiss, who had the abortion known as Alive 4, which was, should have been called Alive 5. But never mind. Well, Kiss just puts stuff out to make money now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can say that again. But um, S&M, No Leaf Clover, the version of Call of Cthulhu on there with the orchestra. Man, yeah. I just moves me every time I hear it. Yeah, rest in peace, Michael Kamen, the director of the orchestra. Yeah. He, he, also, was... did Queen... he also did a Queensryche song on the... Uh... The soundtrack of Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Yeah, Real yeah. World. It's also it was yeah. recorded for the uh, Promised Land album, but was left off because of the movie. Yeah, that, that was a really cool song too. Yeah, and on top of that, he did all the orchestrations on the Wall from Pink Floyd, the Final Cut, and the Division Bell. The orchestration he did on High Hopes always moves me every time I because I listened to the 5.1 mix of the album, just the orchestra part, and I was like, wow, you know, just hearing the string parts isolate, I'm like, oh my god. He was such a genius, you know, and I'm yeah. glad Metallica got to work with Michael Kamen on the S&M project and the Garage Inc. album, which was their covers album. They decided to put all their covers in one collection. That's why Garage Days Revisited is out of print, Garage Days Re-Revisited is out of print, because they put everything into one collection called Garage Inc. And a lot of the covers they did, you know, the cover of Turn the Page was excellent. Kirk Hammett doing the slide part. And the main guitar solo was actually Hetfield playing the simple lead before the final verse, the final chorus, I should say. And um, let's see. Uh, the, the Merciful Fate cover, the Sabra Cadaver cover, um, the cover of Stone Cold Crazy, which was done for the Electra Records thing. That was awesome, too. Whiskey in a Jar. Yep. That was only, great. Yeah, great only, cover of a traditional Irish song. <laughs> yep. Showing and, uh, Metallica's diverse Then Lizzie uh, did. Yep. Then Lizzie did that also, which was awesome. Yeah, then Lizzie did that um, a few years before they became a four piece. Yep. In 73. And then Metallica just revamped their cover and just made it more heavier. 
no that's acoustic like, guitars. That's Stone Cold Crazy. Um, I heard that song. It was on the Electra uh, anniversary album, I guess. Yes. I couldn't find that album. I just wanted the song. I didn't like to really care for the other songs on that album. So I yeah. went to Tower Records in Hollywood and found a, a an import which had that as a B-side, and I played that over, and I loved the Stone Cold Crazy they did of, that, of Queen. Yeah, and then, in fact, James Heffield did get to perform that with the surviving members of Queen and Tony Iommi at the Concert for Life in 92, yeah. which was an awesome... He, James version. said that was the first thrash song ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm watching the footage, friggin'... You know, you had, you know, Brian May, Tony Elmy, and Hetfield looking like your typical metalhead hard rockers. And then John Deacon looking like he was working for a banking firm with his buzz cut and Roger Taylor with short hair wearing a white jumpsuit on the drum kit. Yeah. Like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I'm like, sheesh. But they, you know, that version of Stone Cold Crazy was incredible, even the Garage Inc. one. And my favorite Metallica songs of all time is, um, number five is probably... Might Just Take Your Life, which is the opening, I believe the opening track on um, Death Magnetic, if that's the first song in the album, if my memory serves me well. And number four would be Sanitarium. Number three, To Live Is To Die. I know I would get shot for saying that. Number two, <laughs> Whiplash. And number one, The Call of Cthulhu. I think mine is uh, number five would be... Uh, uh, la, 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 la. Dang it. Should have wrote these down. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think uh, Wolf and Man's a really good one. The number four would be uh, Whiplash. Number th number three would be um, One. Number two would be... Uh, I'll probably get shot for saying this, but I really like uh, Until It Sleeps a lot. I like how it starts off slow. I love the when a song just starts off slow and just kicks into the just gets all heavy. It, I just love that. I, any band that does that, I'm just instantly hooked. <laughs> yeah. And then I think number one would be one. <laughs> yeah, excellent list. Oh, the song I misconstrued as might just take your life is called That Was Just Your Life. I was on topic. I got myself confused with the Deep Purple track, so I had to grab my Death Magnetic CD to yeah. read the track listing. Sometimes, you know, having high-functioning autism, I can remember a lot of things, but sometimes my brain farts and gets confused with other signs, like Deep Purples might just take your life. I was close with the your life bit, but I was just off by a few words. <laughs> yeah, there's too many songs to pick from Metallica for me, like Welcome Home Sanitarium. Uh, just any, really, Master of Puppets is, like, a really kick-ass song. It's just like, like, Welcome Home Sanitarium starts off slow and just kicks into a high gear. I love that crap. <laughs> Same thing with Fade to Black. Yeah, Fade to Black. See, there's a lot of songs that just, you can't really make a list. <laughs> it's just exactly. Like you, you'll make a list and you'll change it five minutes later. Yes. And then, of course, uh, the best live thing they put out was Live Ship Binge and Purge. Yeah, I never heard that. It was too expensive for me. <laughs> well, it's actually pretty cheap now. If you go to Amazon, it's like 30 bucks now for the three CDs, two DVD. Cool, I'll probably get that then. I've been right. trying to get all my Led Zeppelin and Judas Priest. Oh, I have uh, all the Zeppelin catalog and uh, Judas Priest. I have to rebuy a few more, then I'll have everything Judas Priest. Yeah, I still got to watch the concert off Screaming for Vengeance DVD. I oh, that was, that was incredible. Yeah. You know, it's just talking about Metallica, you know, it's just such a great band. I mean, a lot of people, yeah, call them, you know, sellouts and corporate rockaga. I mean, I even like friggin' I Disappear, which some people call the Fat Albert song because of hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I love that song. The video was cool, too, with the load up with the, from MI3, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, MI2. A, MI2. I knew it was one from those Tom Cruise movies. Yes. That was a great song. I remember when everybody got mad when Metallica cut their hair for load, too. <laughs> yeah. People change. Yeah. I mean, you know, the guy, I mean, the only member of Rush, who still had longish hair, was Getty Lee. I mean, no one complained about that. Nope. Because friggin' Neil Peart cut his friggin' hair uh, short as of uh, Power Windows. For the video for uh, Mystic Rhythms, I should say, he cut all his hair short. That's a killer song right there. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, 
before we leave you folks, we're going to go give you a couple of recommendations of albums to check out before we go. First of all, I'm going to go with a couple of picks here, one of which is a hard, heavy album, and the other will be a sort of a departure into the world of um, folk rock. But first, the, the heavy rock, I'm going to recommend at the moment, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll by Twisted Sister. This album... Their second album, their first major label album, was such a great album. So many great songs on it. The Kids Are Back, I Am a Me, Knife in the Back, Right to Live, Live to Ride, the title track. Just an awesome, awesome, awesome album. I know a lot of people think of Stay Hungry and Come Out and Play, but buy You Can't Stop Rock and Roll because that album is a major surprise for uh, you fans of... uh, Twisted Sister, if you like to stay hungry, you sure as hell will love, and believe me, you will love, uh, you can't stop rock and roll. And my other pick is, this is a twist, Time Passages by Al Stewart, his 1978 follow-up to Year of the Cat. Just a unique album, I mean, sometimes I go from hard rock to this in my own eyelash, and there's a lot of great songs in there, people will think of just the title track and song on the radio, but... My favorite song on that album is a song that wasn't a hit, Life in Dark Water, which reminded me so much of Pink Floyd. Then again, Alan Parsons produced the album again. Hypnosis did the cover, and Tim Rennick, who would be the second guitarist for Pink Floyd Post Waters, did the guitar solos on this track, as well as another favorite of mine on the album, The Palace of Versailles. And the final track, End of the Day, such a beautiful piece. So I'm recommending a heavy album out of Twisted Sister and a more subdued album out of Al Stewart. What do you got for recommendations, Mark? I got a new. Al- I'm gonna recommend two new albums that came out recently. One is uh, the first one is Pharmacos. Pharmacos. It's a really great album with uh, it's kind of like Alice in Chains mixed with Ozzy mixed with. It's like a freaking heavy, heavy, heavy album. There's some screaming on it. There's some great singing, great guitar work by Joe Holmes. It's his band. He used to be in Ozzy's band. He ne- he wrote some songs with Ozzy, but was never really on one of his albums because Zach Wilde kept coming back and kicking him out for the album recording, and then he would do the tour. <laughs> so that's a great album. And then another one is with uh, George Lynch's uh, George Lynch and uh, Michael Sweet of Striper and George Lynch from Dokken and Lynch Mob. It's called uh, Sweet and Lynch. It's a really great album, Only to Rise. I really met, recommend it. Great songwriting. Great rhythm section on that album. Uh, Lorenzo and uh, Titchy on on bass and drums. It's a really kick-ass album. I suggest you guys pick that up, too. All right. So this wraps up the unique episode of the Terrence Reardon Experience. Now a duo. So this is Terrence Reardon and... Mark Taylor. Saying so long for now... Have a great day. (laughs) Good night and God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Terrence and Mark experience. So please tune back on in in a few more days and we'll have another episode on whatever album comes to our minds. Again, thank you all for listening. This show is copyright 2015 TJR Rock Sponge Incorporated, all rights reserved. Once again, God bless everybody and good night.